Well, hey, schmoopies, and welcome back to Insex Appeal. Obviously, the ongoing pandemic and its social distancing requirements, as well as worsening environmental factors, has led to plenty of crises and glaring problems for the U.S. over the past year and a half. But some of these seem to slip under the radar for most of the public. Unlike our Asian giant hornets that popped up last year on the west coast, there is another insect threat that seems to be a much more alarming concern as of 2021. Today, on Invasive Infestations, we explore the catastrophic potential of the prolific destroyer moth, these fuzzy forest killers. <laughs> In late May of 2021, reports started hitting the web from the northeastern U.S. complaining of painful skin rashes and the massive outbreak of a dreaded pest on a scale that hasn't been seen in decades. These invaders came in the form of fuzzy caterpillars, the dreaded larval form of the invasive destroyer moth. Later in June, reports began to show the true scale of the outbreak and the devastating defoliation that had begun to scar the landscape and ruin entire orchards of fruit-bearing trees. So what makes these destroyer moths such a plague on humanity? Where did they come from anyway, and how do we stop them? The destroyer moth, Lamantria dispar, are moths belonging to the family Arabidae. Several subspecies are described, and in particular we will be discussing Lamantria dispar dispar, the European or North American destroyer moth, and Lamantria dispar asiatica, the Asian destroyer moth. The European subspecies is of course native to Europe, as well as Western Asia and North Africa, but was accidentally introduced to the northeastern US and Canada, and later the Pacific Northwest. The Asian subspecies hails from Eastern Asia, and was somehow also introduced to the Pacific Northwest. In isolated pockets in the US, Germany and other European regions where the spreading ranges of both subspecies overlap, hybridization is possible and can potentially lead to more hardy invaders. Destroyer moth larvae are capable of feeding on over 500 deciduous and coniferous trees and shrubs, and are considered one of the most devastating pests of hardwood trees in the eastern U.S earning them a solid foothold in the IUCN's listing of 100 of the world's worst invasive alien species. The defoliation caused by these caterpillars can severely weaken trees over time and lead to large areas of forest death due to disease in as little as two to three years of repeated or severe defoliation. These catastrophic caterpillars defoliate at least one million acres of forest every year in the U.S. alone with particularly bad outbreak years resulting in over 10 million total acres of defoliation, resulting in hundreds of millions of dollars in economic loss. But ecologically, this defoliation can also lead to an increased predation on the nests of forest-dwelling birds and the decline of other animals that utilize the forest cover for food and protection. The moth's prolific spread also results in an overall lower survival rate of northern tiger swallowtails and other butterfly caterpillars caterpillars, which may contract novel diseases from the invasive moth caterpillars. With any invasive species that becomes established, there is a ripple effect of imbalance on the native ecological system, and the full extent of damage may not be apparent for decades. Like the evergreen bagworms we learned about in episode 2 of Mystery Bugs, the destroyer larvae of both of these subspecies can spread long distances on silk strands by being picked up and carried on the wind. According to the United States Department of Agriculture, without intervention, this pest spreads about 13 miles per year, with a 2012 study suggesting that storms can accelerate the spread, hypothesizing that strong easterly winds carried L. dispar dispar larvae across Lake Michigan to Wisconsin, a distance of at least 50 miles. This habit of hang gliding or sometimes simply flopping off of a tree also leads to the so-called destroyer moth rash, when the caterpillars happen to 
land on or brush into people during their flight. Exposure to the toxic hairs or setae adorning the caterpillar's body leads to a painful rash, many likened to the effects of poison ivy. These hairs can even become dislodged from the caterpillars and be carried on the wind themselves stinging anyone unlucky enough to happen to be in their flight path. Getting stung by the hairs on a mucous membrane, such as in your eyes, in your mouth, or up your nose, could potentially lead to more severe symptoms, and if you ever handle the caterpillars, hand protection at least is probably a good idea. Like most caterpillars, once our little destroyers get comfortable in their new squirming grounds, they'll eat and grow and molt and eat and grow and molt until maturing in the summer ceasing feeding and laying down a blanket of silk to rest on and prepare to pupate. If population density is low during this season, the caterpillars will elect to hide themselves well before entering the pupal stage. But in years of population explosion like 2021, the caterpillars can be seen pupating en masse, stuck to the trunks of trees out in the open. About two weeks later, the adult moths start to emerge. In destroyer moths, the females are white with slender antennae, and larger than the striped brown males. Despite having fully formed wings, the females of the European subspecies cannot fly, but females of both subspecies use powerful sexy pheromones to attract males. The adult moths get to business quick. Having no actual digestive system or need to eat, they promptly start looking for mates, sometimes boinking with more than one partner before contentedly dying about a week after emerging from their pupae. Immediately after copulation, the female usually ceases pheromone production and either crawls or flies off to a safe nearby place and smears a big ol' egg mass around, coating it in similar irritating hairs sported by the caterpillars. These eggs are usually left on trees, rocks, or buildings, but sometimes the eggs get pasted onto firewood, furniture, or vehicles, which can potentially result in them being transported to new regions. The egg mass is over winter, and the caterpillars hatch and spread again in the spring. Now, despite the hardiness and noxious setae of our destructive little pillars, there are actually several predators and parasites that happily utilize the caterpillars as a resource. Unfortunately, these seem to have little effect on the moth's populations, and so introducing more of such predators and parasitic wasps and flies could just simply create more imbalance in the ecosystem, as many of these will not specialize only to prey on the destroyer caterpillars, but may have a more severe impact on populations of native species which are already in decline. But it turns out that pathogens caused by bacteria, fungi, and viruses seem to be the most effective biological control of the caterpillars, capable of far higher mortality rates than predation and parasitism alone. In particular, the Japanese fungus Entomophagia maimaica has seen great success in controlling outbreaks when introduced into the invasive population. While the resulting pathogen is considered highly host-specific, it is still capable of affecting some other species of caterpillars, so this method could also cause lasting harm in the native ecosystem. So of course, usually pesticides are used to control and eradicate the moth's populations based on the observed density of egg masses preceding the spring hatching season. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic and social distancing guidelines, air crews that would ordinarily monitor and spray the eggs and caterpillars were largely unable to do their work over the past season, allowing for the eggs to go undetected and unmanaged and hatch in much larger numbers than usual this year, and hence our current mass outbreak situation in the Northeast. I'm sure I don't need to tell you that this aerial pesticide spraying method has massive drawbacks as well, leading to declines in native caterpillars, pollinators, and aquatic crustaceans and insect nymphs. Other manual non-chemical or biological methods for removal and destruction of egg masses and caterpillars are common as well, but these can be labor-intensive and so not very practical for mass eradication efforts. Probably the safest method found to diminish the destroyer moth's population has been the mate disruption method, where synthetic pheromones derived specifically from those of the destroyers are used as a bait to lure and confuse adult moths, causing males to waste crucial time chasing false pheromone trails and thus limiting their actual mating encounters. Since this method is incapable of disrupting the lives of other species, it has become a more appealing alternative or complementary method of control, used most effectively in the late summer after rounds of pesticide spraying earlier in the year during the egg or larval stage. 
This combined control method has been successfully used to help contain the spread of the moths in the northeastern U.S. in previous years. So now we see exactly how and how much havoc these caterpillars wreak in North America since their introduction, but how did that happen and what can we learn from this? Well, darlings, this story takes us all the way back to 1845, when an epidemic of several pathogens began killing off native silkworms and later mulberry trees on a massive scale in Western Europe. This decades-long epidemic inevitably led to the decline of the European silk industry and the importation of Asian silk becoming cheaper. But fast forward to 1851, when following Napoleon's coup d'etat of December 2nd, 1851, a French artist and astronomer named Etienne Leopold Drovelo arrived in the United States with his family as political refugees, settling in Medford, Massachusetts. Now, Trovelo was also an amateur entomologist and so became interested in the native silkworms he observed in North America for their potential use in silk production. Like in his home country during this time, the silkworm populations in the eastern U.S. were being ravaged by various diseases. Trovelo hypothesized that he could hybridize silkworms from Europe with these American worms and breed disease-resistant superworms in the hopes of establishing an American silkworm industry. After returning to France for a time, Trovelo came back to Massachusetts in 1868 for some reason bringing with him, of all things, the larvae of the European destroyer moth. He raised the caterpillars in the forest behind his house, attempting to crossbreed them with wild native silkworms when somehow they escaped. Fancy that. It's not clear what exactly happened next, with one source claiming that local officials were warned of the danger, but none of them were willing to get involved with hunting down and killing moth larvae. While another source points out that there is no evidence that Trovelo alerted any government officials at all, despite being aware of the risks. If one thing is for certain, it's that the infestation went unchecked since its effects were not immediately apparent. Trovelo lost interest in entomology after this incident and later returned to France in 1882, by which time the state of Massachusetts was beginning to notice they were dealing with a huge problem. The first ever outbreak level season of destroyer moths in the U.S. happened in 1889, beginning a campaign of eradication and attempted control that continues to this day over a century later. European destroyer moths were first detected outside of the Northeast in Oregon in 1982, and their populations in the Pacific Northwest have remained contained and managed by aggressive eradication efforts. In 1991, the Asian subspecies was detected in North America for the first time in British Columbia, Washington, and Oregon. This invasion was thought to have been caused by caterpillars being blown ashore from Russian ships that had become infested with egg masses. This infestation was said to have been eradicated, but the species popped up again in Washington state in 1997, and again in 2000 in Oregon, having supposedly both been eradicated again in 2005. As of writing in July 2021, the Washington State Department of Agriculture is actively working to eradicate both L. dispar asiatica and L. dispar dispar using the bacterial pesticide spray Bacillus thuringius kerstaki HD1, also known as BTK, before the moths can become established and possibly hybridize with each other. States in the Northeast are also reportedly using BTK, which is known to effectively control the destroyer moths. The caterpillars can pass the bacteria to each other more easily when populations grow denser which unfortunately means that non-target species can be harmed in the process, though it is believed that BTK is safer for non-target species than traditional insecticides. So, it does seem like we've got quite a mess on our hands here, but hopefully the moths can be suppressed enough this year to prevent another disastrous season next spring. So what do we take away from this? I think the one thing I want to highlight here is how one ambitious bozo thinking with his wallet unleashed this whole plague upon North America. Though it could have wound up happening anyway, this ecological catastrophe occurring for well over a century now is traced back to the irresponsible actions of one freaking guy. And I can't help but wonder if Trovelo ever even knew just how devastating the impact of his actions became by the time of his death back home in France in 1895. 
Regardless, let us all strive to never be that guy. Just because you can, doesn't mean you should. This always goes for non-native species. Never release a non-native species into the wild. I feel like this should be common sense, but no matter the circumstance, you must always assume that this would be harmful. And please, accidents do happen, so if an invasive species escapes your care, at least report it to the proper local authorities. And I'm gonna get real negative for a moment and point out that globally most ecological systems or food chains, if not all of them, can probably be said to be totally addled with a myriad of invasive species at this point, leading to the endangerment and extinction of countless species and decreased overall biodiversity. We can never put that proverbial cat back in the bag, but we can at least try to manage the damage done and try to prevent this sort of introduction from even happening. If you're in an area with an active destroyer moth infestation, check your car and belongings for moth eggs before driving out of state. Become familiar with these caterpillars or other invasive species in your area and help educate others about the damage caused by invasive species. And stress that releasing alien species into the wild, no matter what the intention, is irresponsible and absolutely unacceptable. And use this story as an example if you have to. And with that, I do hope you enjoyed this video and learned something new. And let me know what invasive infestation you'd like to learn more about next down in the comments. If you'd like to help Insex Appeal grow and see more content like this, be sure to check out our new Patreon page that just launched. And consider becoming a patron at whatever level you're comfortable to give. Check back soon for new reward tiers. I've got some pretty cool swag and bonus content planned for my patrons. And if you liked this video, I'm sure you'll do the first episode of Invasive Infestations about the Asian giant hornet situation in North America. Anyway, thanks for tuning in to Insects Appeal, and I'll see you in the next one.